So this is what's left of the causeway. Yeah, most of these buildings that are here are, are of the era that is the neighborhood known as the causeway. Um, the causeway was basically uh, given that name due to the water um, being on either sides of the road, the swamp land, and then having to build up the road much like a causeway in order to uh, be able to travel across the marshland that's here. Okay. Um, if you look at old maps, you can actually see the water coming up to the corner of Eastern Avenue um, and about central area. So you can really kind of get a picture of how wet and nasty this, this area was originally because of the, the Harford Run. Now these buildings here are of the era, the causeway, it's pretty much called the causeway from a, probably around the, I don't know, 1820s, 1830s, all the way up to, you know, 1910s, close to the 1920s, this neighborhood's referred to it as. So these buildings are of the era. And you can see that it's, even back in the day when they were brand new, they probably weren't the nicest looking of places. But the depth of the, the heart of the causeway would have been the next block. Um, Which is all cleared out now. It's all cleared out, unfortunately. Uh, H&S Bakery cleared it out. But like any city, the urban renewal, what happens is, is you take your bad neighborhoods and you rip them out and you put something in its place. So that's pretty much what happened. Um, down on the block over here, um, one block up near Spring Street, which is between Caroline and Eden, is the heart of the causeway. That's where the most, most of the action happened. So most of these places, almost every single one of them would have been um, a bar per se. More importantly, it was a whorehouse. Okay. Um, the lowest level of sailors would come up to this neighborhood to drink um, as opposed to being down on Thames Street where um, people with more money would be, your, your, your captains of industry, your, your captains of boats. Um, the draymen, uh, your boiler makers, things like that. Guys that are down here doing the, the, the rough and tumble work, this is where they spend their money. And there's essentially no rules in the neighborhood. And it seems like they're doing the rough and tumble at work and then they're doing the rough and tumble after work. Absolutely. And we spoke of George Koenig. His house would have been on the north side of the street, um, right there close to Spring Street. Okay. Now his rival, James Manley, who was the um, chief fighting man of the American club, uh, the Roughskins, the Roughskin Hall was directly across the street from him, as well as James Manley's whorehouse. <laughs> so you had two rival whorehouses, Koenig's whorehouse, Manley's whorehouse, and they're looking across the street at each other every day. That's, that's gotta be, Pardon me saying this, a huge pissing match of who was going to leave first, and I can imagine neither of them wanted to be that one. There's numerous uh, occurrences right here on the corner um, by this brick building on the end here of shooting matches between Manley's crew and George Koenig. George Koenig was often by himself causing trouble. He, <laughs> he didn't need a gang around him. He, he'd see five, six people, and he would jump right in and, and start shooting. It'd and be all right. <laughs> as you said before, he could take a bullet. <laughs> yeah, he was a tough guy. Now, you talk about elections. Um, th there's quite a few. Some of these buildings, I haven't found it exactly just yet, but one of these buildings right here on this block was a polling house uh, during one of the municipal elections. Okay. Um, one of the, the larger elections, it happened again right here um, next door to the, uh, the Roughskin Club. There was a polling house, and that was the... Uh, the polling house that they, they built this fence out front to kind of control the way people would come in. Now this was built by the gangs and they plopped a cannon right there aiming out at the people. So when you're walking up, you have a cannon facing you. You're going to vote for the people they want <laughs> you to vote for. The, the police sat across the street and they were like, <laughs> they want nothing to do with this. <laughs> and so the, the rough skins are out there. They have their gang house next door where all their muskets and pistols are. Um, there's probably about 20 or 30 of them, and they're basically running up and down Dallas Street, up and down Caroline, up and down Bond, shooting people that they know are Democrats, chasing them away. And if any of them got to the polling uh, house, they had to go through this contraption, which kind of cornered them in and allowed them to basically be ambushed inside. Oof. And That's it, incredible. There's numerous, numerous newspaper accounts, various different elections where there's just bands of American Party members, roughskins, just moving up and down these streets attacking. Now George Koenig rallies the neighborhood. Um, he would chase them up the neighborhood and fight them up over here. Then he would get pushed back down into the second ward. Uh, a famous incident with a man named uh, uh, Francis cutting Toby Connolly. Um, there was a, a running gun battle 
and he was shooting at somebody who had a knife. He was trying to stab this guy. Uh, the guy had a knife. Uh, the guy slipped and fell. Um, and his defense that got him out of court was that he slipped and fell on his own knife. Um, but a guy named Cutting Toby, no, he didn't stab him. <laughs> so. Wow. Wow. Uh, but it, you can kind of see the remnants of the old causeway. And it's kind of just walking. I've actually been down this street many, many times. Um, I get my tattoos right down the street. And I never thought to just stop and say that this, I knew it looks historic, but just what this was. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of amazing when you just kind of stop and think about it. Yeah, the, the, all these buildings, like I said, um, there, there's a, on the corner of Eden and Eastern was uh, a reformers and religious attempt at reforming the causeway. It, it was called the Causeway Mission. And they had a map of houses of ill repute um, during that era, and they would put a dot wherever there was a house of ill repute. And automatically, automatically assume that uh, Tame Street is going to be chock full of all these houses of ill repute. Right. Right here, Eastern Avenue is wall to wall, dot after dot going down there. It's actually a really neat map. Now, the Causeway Mission was related to the, uh, um, the mission that is currently on, uh, well, it was on Broadway um, and Thames Street, the Port Mission. Okay. They were basically sister organizations, but it was kind of like a, trying to get the young kids off the street, take care of orphans. It was a Sunday school. Um, it was an attempt at making the guys coming down here to the whorehouses feeling bad about themselves. <laughs> okay. Now, if you Very actually cool. can see some of the homes down here as well, they are reminiscent of that era as well. So you were saying that these are a good example of the old houses? Yeah, this is definitely an example of what the causeway would have looked like. Um, obviously a lot nicer than it was back in the day. Um, these houses, again, a little bit smaller than what you'd find down, say, Bond Street. Um, they're of the era. Um, one thing you have to take a look at when looking at these homes is it, when these criminals were setting up coops and setting up things, they would often use multiple places and then punch a hole through the wall. Okay. It was to disorient the people that they were taking. And there's a newspaper account over on Eastern and Caroline of people going into a coop and they walked into a room, walk, walked into a second story and then went through into another building and went down through a backyard. So it was almost like a wow. tunnel. It was a maze. But everybody in the neighborhood was involved in these politics, in these gangs. So usually so, neighborhoods would be set up along political lines? Typically. Typically it would have been on political lines. You, you know, you're, you're hanging out on Dallas Street with your friends. You're, you become like-minded. You share the same beliefs and ideas. And so they would, uh, they would freaking together, just like modern gangs do today. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you grew up when you were young. Remember that the gangs would start off very young as young fishing clubs and then turn into the firemen and the political gangsters that they became later in life. So they ended up sharing some of the same uh, uh, same beliefs. And it was almost like a, a, a culture of indoctrination into what a neighborhood is. So if George Koenig is running this block, he's telling everybody what to believe in, what to do. And you, I don't think you really want to say anything against what he's saying. I was going to say, if somebody that takes on five guys with guns <laughs> is telling me to believe in something or outside, I'd probably tell them, yes, everything you say is true. Well, also, the, the Democratic Party, which ran uh, um, the second ward, the Democratic Party would give you jobs. So if you voted, so if you're poor and you're living in some of the, the smaller ramshackle houses that are down on the causeway, um, and you want to move up the social ladder, you're going to put in work for the Democratic Party as a hope of getting a job. So it's, it's again, being a fighting man is a career and it is a way to move up the social ladder. Um, it's so it starts to dominate your life. It's, it's a very interesting time in, in history in Baltimore. Um, and Koenig being the neighborhood boss, he would be able to say, hey, I need you know, two draymen to work on a ship today. He could come up here and say, you two, I want, you know, give me a quarter out of your pay and I got you a job for the day. Or come clean my whorehouse, <laughs> one of the two. And so, it, you know, it, it's, you, you intended to, the dominant party in your neighborhood would be who you'd ally with. Now the causeway became a, a spot of violence because 
you had the two political factions that were so close to each other. So you had the Democrats with George Koenig and the double pumps, and then you had the Roughskins, the American Party, and James Manley and his boys, and they were right across the street from each other. And so it became constant running battles. Wow. Um, it, w it was nonstop, so, uh, especially on uh, the great old Baltimore elections. Wow. Cool. Very cool. Wow. This did become a African American neighborhood, especially Spring Street. Okay. And all that. And again, take a look at old neighborhoods in history. So here we are at the great Edgar Allan Poe's grave. Yeah, this is, uh, for what we've been talking about, it's kind of the, the start of an era, and then a block away, you have the end of that same era. Um, you know, you're standing here, this, the start of that, that uh, volunteer fire company violence at, at its peak, you can say that the, the kidnapping and death of Poe um, would be probably the, the beginning of it. Um, the end of it would be uh, Rigdon, Officer Rigdon being shot down the street here and uh, um, then being hung over at the uh, uh, Baltimore City Jail uh, a couple months later. Um, it's rather interesting to take a look. We're, we're sitting here at Poe's grave and we're kind of in the middle of a very uh, fought after neighborhood uh, during the Volunteer Fire Company days. Um, right over at Lexington Market, which is a block away you have the New Market Fire Company. And the New Market Fire Company is the, uh, the biggest and baddest of the, uh, uh, the Democratic crews. Um, all the Plug Ugly members learned and plied their trade over at the New Market Fire Company. The okay. Plug Uglies were originally members of the New Market. The street gang, when they were young kids, the gumballs, they were all originally New Market Fire uh, kids. Uh, they, were, they were learning everything. That was the first hardcore nasty fire crew in Baltimore City and as Democrats and Whigs had this shift in educate uh, or in political thought um, so as the political thought shifts and changes the new market has a split and the Mount Vernon Fire Company comes about over on the west side of the city which is the plug uglies okay um, at that time you also have uh, across the street here, which was uh, Ragburg Street. On Ragburg Street was the Rip Rap uh, American Club. Okay. Um, so the Rip Raps were as tough as the Plug Uglies. They were an American crew, um, uh, just as violent. Uh, they were run by Gregory Barrett, and one of their famed uh, members uh, was uh, Mal Crop, Marion Crop. Uh, Crop is, is hung uh, the same day as uh, Henry Gambrell, Peter Corey, and Cyphus. It's, uh, uh, again, that's the ending of and the era, there. which we can talk about when we go around a corner. You can kind of see how the neighborhood was laid out. I'll describe it to you. Not many of the buildings are left, but it'll kind of give you a sense of uh, the end of an era and, uh, uh, and the, as we're here, beginning. the beginning of an era. And it seems it, when you think of like gang violence, you don't think of it as systemic across a city. But we're on the complete other side of President Street, well away from Fells Point and the Causeway, and there was a heavy presence here too. Yeah, the, this would be probably your largest concentration of fire gangsters per se, um, with with the Rip Rap Club being right here, the Plug Uglies being up the street, New Market being over here. This is just a hotbed of violence and. During that era, the largest gun battle, largest fight that happened occurred actually at Lexington Market. Wow. And it was an ambush of the New Market Fire Company by both the Rip Raps and the Plug Uglies. Wow. All right, we're standing here on a very famous corner, um, what was known as Cherry's Corner. Okay. Um, during the 1850s, there was a gentleman right here on a corner that lived here. He had a tobacco shop, um, and his name was Edward Ned Cherry. Um, Cherry was an American Party uh, supporter. Um, it became the social hub of the neighborhood. Baltimore Street at the time frame, um, this was full of bars and restaurants. There was quite a few. Um, right here on the corner of the Cherry's Corner, then there was a building right next to it, which was Amy's Restaurant and okay. Bar. And then right next to it was on a, right here, close to Westminster Burial Ground, uh, 
is the Western District Watch House. Okay, so there were three buildings where this one building is Yeah, down. going down this way, going down, down Green right. Street. Okay. Now, why is this area important? Why is Cherry's Corner important? This is the hotbed of American violence, um, American party violence in this area from the Rip Rap Club. Okay. You had mid-block here, Ragburg Street, and the Rip Rap Club uh, was actually located on Ragburg. Okay. And the sad irony of it is, is the, the, um, the Rip Rap Club backed up to a house which was down here between uh, uh, Pearl and Pine Street was Officer Robert Rigdon's house. Okay. And they butted up against each other, which Oof. is kind of ironic, uh, which we'll get into. So now, in September of uh, 1856, just up the street, if you take Green Street all the way up, you're in the heart of plug ugly territory. Okay. Um, over by St. Mary's, there's uh, the infamous murder of Officer Benjamin Bent. Okay. And long story short, how the murder went down to us is the, the plug uglies were out having a night drinking. They heard of a house party. There were some young girls there. They were gonna go uh, try to meet some young ladies. and. Uh, this, Apparently, they had some uh, uh, some people over. They went to the house, and the parents didn't particularly care for how drunk the plug uglies were. Okay. Um, an officer was walking by. Um, there's multiple officers walking the beat. Um, he gets involved. Of course, the plug uglies are not going to uh, go calmly. They start to resist arrest. And uh, Officer Rigdon and Officer Benjamin Benton eventually make it on the scene. Okay. Um, there's about four or five plug uglies there, and essentially they start to drag a guy away who's fighting with the officers, and they're going to take him here to the Western District Watch House and arrest him for rioting. Okay. And as they're dragging him away, he's still fighting, he's still fighting. Somebody runs up and puts a bullet into the neck behind the ear of uh, Officer Benjamin. Ben. <sighs> wow. Rigdon is standing there holding their prisoner, and he sees... So he claims Henry Gambrel. Okay. Gambrel runs away. He gets arrested later at a plug ugly bar and um, eating watermelon. Uh, he's arrested. He's immediately brought uh, to the Central District. Uh, he's brought up on charges. And at that point, this is just horrific. The city starts to just burst at the seams. They had enough. Wow. They've been dealing with almost a decade of. of uh, just supreme violence in the city where the gangs just controlled everything. Uh, it's a pretty big to do. It's arguably one of the largest trials in the, in the city at, wow. its, at its time. Um, so Gambrel is put on trial um, and he is uh, convicted of okay. the murder, first degree murder of Officer Benjamin Benton. So uh, was he a symbol? He was a reformer. He became a reformer symbol. The reformers wanted to end the volunteer fire department days, end the club politics, and bring calm to the city. And this was kind of like the final straw, uh, the murder of, of uh, Officer Bent. And so this became a very big deal. Okay. And it's also the city kind of taking a stand, whereas you know Henry Gambrell and his boys could murder at will, and there was never really an issue. Right. And now the city's saying, enough. We're putting you on trial. Now, Gambrel is sitting there waiting for help from his boys. He thinks he's going to beat this, this charge. It turns out that there's some evidence that he didn't do it. Really? And in fact, there's a deathbed confession of one of his friends admitting to the murder. Um, so wow. Henry Gambrel's sitting in jail and he's waiting to be found innocent of the murder of Benjamin Benton. Um, he's waiting for his friends to come forward. I think the plug uglies actually knew who did it. And it became one of those things like, do we rat out our other plug ugly friend? Like, what do we do, you know? This is a, a, a kind of a moral dilemma for the plugs at the time. Wow. And again, they think that through their political ties and the power that they, they had in this area, that they were gonna beat it. And it turns out that they don't beat it. So then on Monday, uh, November 8th, uh, 1858, the verdict comes down guilty, and this rioting starts happening outside of the uh, the uh, the courthouse. Wow! And is the rioting caused by the gangs? The gangs, yes. Okay. The rip raps, um, the rough skins, the plug uglies are all there in support of Henry Gambrel, and they they actually charge a uh, uh, a bus 
that Gambrel was put in to be taken over to the city jail, essentially attempting to have him escape. Okay. So Gambrel goes off to city jail. At this scene, you have two individuals. You have uh, Mal Kropp and you have a guy by the name of Peter Corey. Mal Kropp is a notorious uh, um, riprap. He's very violent. All the accounts of him is just, everybody says he's a guy you don't mess with. Okay. Um, he's, he's very big, brawny. Um, you would spot him in the street. Uh, he was a rough guy. Peter Corey is new to the area. He's actually a butcher up in the Plug Ugly neighborhoods. And he's hanging out with a bad crew, almost guilt by association. He wants to, he believes in the politics of the American party. He sees how powerful the plugs are. And he, he's kind of intoxicated by it. He's hanging out with this rough crew. He's drunk. So they're downtown. They're hanging out. The verdict comes down. They're distraught. Immediately, Crop and Corey go to number 11 Holiday Street, grab a pistol, and start making their way to this corner. Okay, this corner right this here. This corner right here. Now, they had known through their, their political ties that Robert Rigdon was going back to work that night. Okay. Now, Robert Rigdon had testified against Henry Gambrell and is really the star witness that, that seals Henry Gambrell's fate. I think there's a little bit of anger involved because I think they know that Gambrell didn't do it. And here's Rigdon lying. Pointing I think that's what they believe. Okay. Um, is it true I wasn't there? <laughs> now, they, they're starting to make their way down here. On their way down here, multiple people see Mr. Crop, and they see that he has what appears to be a large knife or pistol in his arm. And he starts talking about how he's going to, uh, you know, or how Henry Gamble was innocent, and Robert Rigdon is a liar. and. Again, he, he starts to, they must know through their political ties what's happening within the police department. Now, Rigdon was originally assigned to uh, the Plug Ugly neighborhood. That was his beat. And they pulled him out of the neighborhood for fear that he was going to get attacked. Okay. And they put him down here in the heart of Rip Rap country, which is not much safer. And he's to walk the beat. So after the verdict comes down, Rigdon comes down here and he's walking the beat. He's actually kitty corner. His beat is from Green Street all the way down to Fremont Avenue. Okay. Um, he doesn't mind this beat because his house, again, is right about a block down this way on the right-hand side is where he lives. His wife has a uh, dry goods store and okay. they live behind it. And so he starts to walk the beat. Crop and Corey are first, they're seen coming down the street here and they, they confront a group of people here. They're drunk. They're aggressive. He pulls his gun on probably about three different individuals this night, and nobody says anything. Like, apparently, that's totally okay, or nobody wants to mess with him. Okay. Um, every time, everybody's like, you know, come on, stop it. And he keeps <laughs> talking about the verdict. Everybody in the whole city is talking about the verdict. And he starts to stalk Robert Rigdon as he's walking the beat. Now, Robert Rigdon is walking in and out of the bars and restaurants, checking on him, um, just seeing what's going on in the neighborhood, doing his job. Um, a couple other officers are walking with him. I think they realize how uh, dangerous the situation is. Okay. So he, normally you would have one officer on this side of the street, another officer on this side of the street, and they'd be walking. And to communicate with each other, uh, they would take their billy club and hit it against uh, a pole. And okay. And it would cause the other cops in the area to, to come and uh, support each other. Okay. Um, so they're starting to stalk him. There's a bar down the street here, across the street from Rigdon's house, where they go in, and when Rigdon comes out with the other police officer, Crop is actually standing there pointing a gun at him. Really? And nobody does anything. He doesn't have the right shot, so he kind of drops back, puts it away, starts walking down the street. He's continuing to stalk him. Robert Rigdon's continuing to walk down the street, walk down the street. He actually confronts them. They go into another restaurant, they come out, they bump into each other. They're kind of like, whoa, what's going on? Yeah. They, they basically, Corey says, am I speaking with Robert Rigdon? He says, yes. And Crop says, Rigdon, you always knew me to be a square guy, right? Yes. And then they look at him and they say, Gamble was innocent. And they kind of go their own way. Now, it's about 7.30 on that day. It's a rainy day. It's a little bit uh, uh, a little bit cold. They come back over here. Again, they go to Amy's Tavern, which is located next to the, the station. Um, at 7.30, they have roll call. Uh, so it's the end of Rigdon's shift. He survived this day. He goes in, does his roll call. Crop and Corey are standing back here on Cherry's Corner. They're, 
again, talking about the verdict with anybody on the street. And again, this is an American Club hotbed. And Rick then walks out of the, the Western District Station house and walks across the street to go home. And he would have walked this path. He would have walked out right down the street here. Um, Crop and Corey. Corey goes across the street here. Now Crop follows him on this side and they kind of shadow him down the street. He goes into his house. Corey comes across the street. Crop and Corey kind of figure out what they're going to do. Uh, again, Corey's drunk. He goes into the dry goods store owned by Rigdon's wife. Uh, and he's trying to find out where in the house Rigdon is. So he's kind of looking around, acting like he's going to buy something. And he's looking back through this doorway to try to see. And Rigdon's wife realizes that this guy's drunk and he's kind of an idiot <laughs> and whatnot. And essentially, they kind of nonchalantly get out of here. Yeah. He sees Rigdon cross the room, so he knows he's in the back room. I don't know if a signal is made, but Croc goes alongside this very narrow alley of uh, Rigdon's house, and there's a tiny window in back. Now, there's multiple people in the room, his wife, there's an orphan child that they had brought in to take care of. Um, there's another gentleman, another female, their, their names escape me at the moment, but uh, they're in there, they're, t they're talking. Uh, Rigdon says something to the tune of, you know, why didn't you just get that guy out of here? She's like, why? Do, or she says it to him, and he's like, I'm not a cop right now, you know, that kind of thing. And he has his his arm up on a mantle. Okay. And the window is right here when a gunshot rings out. He's essentially hit with almost like a shotgun in his rib cage. Ooh. He falls to the floor. Oh my God, I've been killed. And he dies a couple of minutes later in agony. As soon as the gunshots heard, multiple police officers start across the street. They see. Corey, jettison across the street as fast as he can. He's running across the street. People are yelling, stop, stop, stop. Cops start chasing him right down here, uh, down uh, through the alleyways south of Baltimore Street. Crop actually starts to chase after him, his own friend. He starts to chase after him like, stop him, yeah, get him. And then he stops and realizes, okay, I got to get out of the neighborhood. Crop is the shooter. Cop goes back down the alley to the Rip Rap Club. He meets up with Kitty Chambers, another uh, famous uh, rip rap, and some of the other uh, local gangsters. He comes down Radford Street, circles back around, actually goes into Rigdon's house <laughs> and says, oh my God, they've shot Robert Rigdon. This is terrible. We will get him. He's the guy that murdered him. He's looking at the body of the person he just shot. Wow. That's, that's brazen. The cops know it. And they're like, you did this. And he's like, arrest me. And they wouldn't do it. They didn't know yet that they caught Corey down the street. Two officers were actually walking up, I believe it was German Street at the time. Uh, they were walking up German as he was running down. Um, he gets into a gun battle with the officers that are, that are chasing him and they catch him. And the reason why this corner is important, they drag him back here to the Western District Station House. They proceed to beat the living hell out of him. As I'm sure any police officer would in those days. Yeah. Um, they beat him. Um, they actually chain him to the ground, and they're, they're beating him. He confesses and actually pins uh, the murder on Crop. Crop is then arrested over at number 11 Holiday Street, and they are brought into city jail. Already in city jail waiting to be executed is Henry Gambrel. Now Corey is there. Now Crop is there. And on uh, April 8th, it's a Friday, um, 1859, four people are hung. Three of them related to wow. American party violence, and one was a, was a black gentleman named Cyphus. But they were hung all together on that day. So that's why this little corner here is the little court. Down over on the end of the street, you have the gravesite of Edgar Allan Poe, who was cooped. Again, it was a political move, voting, and power. And that power builds, and it culminates in the murder with Officer Rigdon. And after the murder, after the hanging, did that relieve tension? Did that break, uh, did, was that like a break in the back of the gangs? It was, they, they, did not, they did not feel that they could get away with murder. Okay. I mean, prior to that, they would just shot him in the street and said, yeah, I shot him, what are you gonna do about it? Yeah. You know, I mean, 10 people will testify that I was across the city. You know, so they they had to start being a little more cautious. So the murder rate does start to dip. Um, coincidentally, you have the Civil War starting up. Okay. As the Civil War starts to 
really take hold, a lot of the guys end up fighting. Okay. The American Party fights for the union cause. Which, and the Democrats, George Koenig is an ardent uh, Southern sympathizer. Um, Koenig becomes even more violent, whereas the, the plug uglies, they almost kind of branch into more of an organized crime setting, okay. more hidden. Um, they actually, during the Civil War, um, they have a racket where they are uh, kidnapping uh, African Americans and selling them into slavery. Oh, um, so they would use their ties in the, in the, uh, um, the watch houses and just go in and grab a black man that was arrested and then sell him into slavery. Wow. Um, so there was that racket. Uh, they were involved in lottery schemes. Over on this corner right here was a lottery house. So they were running illegal numbers rackets, essentially. They'd, um, they become organized criminals. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're almost become pariahs after the hanging. The city's had enough with it. And they have to be a little more clandestine. So is this really the start of, like, mob mentality? Not, not necessarily mob mentality is the wrong way of saying it, but, like, the mob. That organized crime. Here in Baltimore, yes. I mean, mob as a whole, no. But here in Baltimore, the the, the, the roots of organized crime, you can say, is the remnants of the old volunteer fire okay. days. I mean, you have a group of guys that they're paid to fight, get drunk, and murder. It's very hard to come down off of that. It's a very exciting time frame. Yeah. Very, you know, you got to kind of, it becomes a drug and becomes addicting. And I think they, they move into crime. I mean, they're already notorious. They can intimidate they can extort. Okay. People are scared of them, you know, so they can move that direction. George Koenig, over in the causeway, stays a political beast. Okay. And he is actually uh, up front and center during the uh, Pratt Street riots, if not okay. one of the major causes of it. Okay. <laughs> they I, should. I've just, I, I gotta find time to actually write it. I'm, what I was gonna do is do a historical uh, fiction. Okay. And then do a screenplay. That would be cool. Just, you know, maybe two series. I mean, I even got the opening scene, like, mapped out in my head. There was a massive uh, uh, congregation of reformers meeting outside, having speeches, and they bring this parade by to show their power. And on this forge, they're making gigantic carpenter awls, and they're actually hammering them out on there. And they stop in front of the reformers going, this is what's coming for you. I mean, that's how brazen these guys were. They don't care. Wow. And then if you tie that into, that's how tough the Americans were. Now think about George Koenig. He's standing up to this. Yeah. That's a brave boy. <laughs> so, that's he's... nuts. Oh. The fact that, I know that, you know, people want to say that, oh, you know, Edgar Allan Poe was so famous, okay, and that he wasn't cooped. Well, let, let's put this in perspective. On April 19th, 1861, you have federal troops, armed soldiers coming through Baltimore, and they're attacked. Now, they're attacked by citizens? No. They're attacked by people that are brave enough to do that. Right. They're attacked by gang members. They're attacked by the double pumps. They're attacked by George Koenig and his boys. They are not afraid of federal troops. <laughs> I think, not gonna I be think afraid the gang of members a... today would run and hide if the U.S. Army showed up. Jeez. These guys back then... They didn't they're like, care. oh, federal troops? You got a gun? So do I. Let's fight. <laughs> you know? It, yeah. It, and Koenig is standing in front, marching with the troops, and he's holding a secessionist flag. Wow. And the fight, the, the fight actually starts when they grab the, the, the secessionist flag, and he has, a, like, a battle over it. And then a soldier gets hit in the head with a brick, and then the double pumps attack from behind and any other sympathizers, Democratic sympathizers, start attacking the federal troops. And Koenig is just, let's do it, boys. <laughs> and know? that was the start, the Pratt Street riot? That was the Pratt Street riot. Jeez. Wow. And he said the night before at the Customs House, he said, they will not pass unmolested. I will make sure of that. It's, He's it's, brought up on treason. I mean... It, <laughs> and somehow beats it. Yeah. Wow. And so people who say, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, everybody in the city knew him, all these gang members, how many of them do you think knew how to read and write? Not very many. How many would give a crap who Edgar Allan Poe was? Oh, if they're shooting cops in the streets, <laughs> I don't think they care about a drunk poet. Yeah, no. They, but yeah, right across the street here next to close to Lexington Market is where you had the New Market Fire Company. Unfortunately, the building doesn't stand anymore. Um, but that was, it was a massive structure. Um, it was a symbol of power. Um, and they were often showing off in this neighborhood. And it was, it was the center of all politics and violence in this neighborhood. 
So we're at uh, the old jail, which Correct. is not old. It's old, but it's still active. It, it's actually, I believe it's the oldest running penitentiary jail system in the entire United States, if not the world. Wow. Um, continuously running. Um, it, the first inmate in the Maryland penitentiary was, um, was a black gentleman um, in November of 1811. Okay. They had started working on the penitentiary um, around 1804, 1805. And you can actually see remnants of the original structures and old school walls and things of it. And so it's kind of a combination of old and new. Um, and importantly, you, you kind of have this entrance, this gatehouse that was here. Now it would have been walled, there's a modern wall here. And this building right here, I believe, would have been part of the original city jail structure. You look down there, that's a part of the original wall, original structure. You're, you're probably looking um, probably close to the time of uh, 18, uh, um, 11 of when that wall was built. So um, the white wall, the white after brick the wall over there, yeah, okay. and it goes back through. Now, on the the day of the uh, execution, there was multiple people lined up to get in. You actually had to fill out an application to get in to witness the execution. Um, and it, again, it was a very very big deal. Thirty thousand people, it's estimated, um, were in the hills. Um, north and west of here wow. to try to see over the walls and see the execution happen. And of course, a lot of this, like the the, uh, the 83, yeah, yeah, none that. of that was there. So no, this you was, had a clearer view. This than was what you actually now. almost country. Okay. Um, there would have been just trees and hills and everything around us. This was built away from the city. Okay. So seeing all the uh, development around here now gives it kind of like a false sense of what it really truly looked like. Now. If you come over this way, we have, again, this old city building. And the best estimation that I have as to where it happened is just on the other side of this wall, down a ways. We can actually see through from over here. Okay. It, during the gang days in the 1850s, uh, jail life, is expressive. It's very, very hard. Now, jail would be your short-term sentences. Okay. Um, whereas uh, the penitentiary would be long-term. Kind okay. of like today, prison is is after one year, jail is you know, all up to one year. Okay. So, okay. it's similar to that. Now, the penitentiary was not a very, very nice place. And it, if you recall the story of Koenig, Koenig goes in for stealing uh, silk. And he goes in you know, a rough and tumble character, right. but he comes out just a maniac. He's covered in tattoos. He has a horrific wound on his arm. Um, there's battles that go on. It's it's a very harsh, harsh environment, and only the strong really truly do survive the penitentiary in those days. Um, it was extremely cold and damp, especially if you're on the lower floors. Um, it, it was awful. Now, the penitentiary would have been right over here. Okay. This would have been the city jail. Now, they okay. were separated by walls. And if you look straight down here, kind of where that tower is back yeah. there, right probably close to where that tower was, I believe is where the scaffolding and the gallows were set up. Okay. Now they were very high. Um, it, it was almost as if the city was putting it on parade for everybody to see. So those weren't just gallows that were always there. They made the gallows specifically for this hanging. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I do okay. believe so. Okay. Now the gallows, were raised up high for view. Um, they had, to the tune of 500 militia and or uh, police, as well as watchmen guarding. They were very concerned that the American clubs were going to try to stage some sort of breakout. I mean, if they were brazen enough to kill a cop, yeah. right in broad daylight, and then run up and go, oh my God, he's dead. Now, it's not a far stretch. One of the, the guys that worked in uh, the, the jail was a member by the name of Gregory Barrett. I mentioned him earlier. He was the most prominent member of the Rip Rap Club. He was the boss. He worked in the jail. And there are letters that are going back and forth between Barrett and Mal Krop on, hey, get me out of here, break me out, send me a file. And they, they do actually, uh, Krop tries to get out. He tries to escape. Now. They had 50 or so police officers guarding the entrance 
because uh, because of, of their how scared they were and their concerns. Uh, the third it happened on a Friday, the Thursday before he's with his family. All of them are with their families. Crop uh, actually writes a letter uh, to the judge and says, "I confess, I killed Officer Rigdon." Gambrel yeah. maintains his innocence the entire time. Um, Peter Corey feels like an idiot. He hung out with the wrong crowd, and now he's getting killed for it. Yeah. Uh, so, kids, choose your friends wisely. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he's, they're all distraught. Gambrel is very upset. He's visibly shaken. He's crying all night long. His family is just completely distraught, as is Corey's. Uh, Mal Crap is, is upset. He's crying on his father's shoulder. Um, they do write letters um, explaining their guilt or innocence. Um, Syphus maintains his innocence uh, of the murder that he was convicted of. Uh, and they bring them out right down over here. Uh, when they bring them out, uh, Crop seems to be the strongest of them, as okay. well as Syphus. It's almost as if they are accepting what had happened. They all say a brief statement. A hymn is sung, um, and then at about 11.05 in the morning on uh, uh, Friday, April 8th, it's a sunny, beautiful morning, um, it turned overcast, kind of ominous, and they walk up there, and they're hung. Wow. Um, Corey is killed instantly, his neck sat, snaps instantly. Okay. Uh, Gambrel is next. He fights for a couple of minutes, and then he dies. Um, Cyphus and Crop, uh, they, were, they were much larger in stature, much more physically fit. Um, uh, they actually end up fighting for quite some time and struggle wow. uh, for a while. Wow. Uh, and like I said, about 30,000 people. Imagine this would be the, one of the biggest spectacles of Baltimore City at the time. Uh, you got people just crowding around this jail trying to get a glimpse of what's happening. You have people standing on the Washington Monument with binoculars trying to look over the walls. All the hills that are behind us people are up on top of them. Any building that was near here, they were on the rooftops trying to look and see and watch the quartet hang. Um, and if you uh, take a look, there is one picture. Um, I have not found it yet. I've got the drawing of the picture. Um, and it kind of shows, that kind of gives me the best guess as to where on the grounds this did occur. It's, it's, it's staggering to me how when something like this happens, that's this spectacle of death, which in some cases for some of the people that weren't innocent, it was come full circle with how much they've done in their life to then be, have it happen to them. Yeah, it's, uh, it was definitely a spectacle. I mean, uh, you know, people would, there was flyers, there was, uh, uh, what was it, I believe it was the, uh, the ballad of Henry Gamble. Uh, young kids in the neighborhood were, were paid to pass it out to people in the crowds. And it's a song of the story of Henry Gamble. And now you said that later on it was found that he was innocent. It is believed that he's innocent. Believe. There, there's a deathbed confession of a gentleman that was a plug ugly that was there. Then he says he did pull the trigger. Um, Gambro maintains his innocence until he hangs. Okay. Um, he basically says on the gallows, uh, you're hanging an innocent man. Uh, his family maintains the innocence. And it, it's hard to believe him. You know, his brother was a notorious plug ugly, John Wesley Gambrel. Um, he was a violent boy as well. And the irony of the whole entire thing is, is that John Wesley Gambrel gets uh, uh, convicted of a charge and the main witness is Officer Rigdon. So there is, with Benton and Rigdon being there, there is a bad blood between the plug uglies and them. Right. Um, it's almost guilt by association, and it's the, the fanaticism of the time just saying enough is enough. And I don't think Gambrel, even if people came out and said, hey, I did it, I don't think they would let him go. Wow. I think he had to hang. He had I to think hang. the city had to kill him. And unfortunately, that's the way it was. Yeah. Um, Crop, again, he admitted to doing it. Um, it's, uh, it's very trying in the situation and it's tough uh, yeah and i think part of the anger from the the trial like i said was is that i believe that the plug uglies did know that that harris did it and not gambrel and they just couldn't figure out a way to make it happen they thought maybe their political ties would have 
have had Henry vindicated. I mean, they were vindicated every other time before. Yeah. Well, I guess this is, as you said, this is the end of the era right here. This is where it all changed. Absolutely. Yeah, right down there, that 11.05 in the morning, that era, for the most part, ended. Wow. The firehouse itself is of the area. I believe the firehouse was built in 1856. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that, but the, the way that these old towers worked was you had bells, and then you also had the, the tower up high. You had people manning the tower all the time. They were looking for smoke. They were looking for fires. Um, now, the bell was to alarm the neighborhood, one. Two, it was also to give directions to uh, the fire company as they were moving. So let's say they see a fire a couple blocks down this way. The bell would start ringing, and then they would start sending the code through the bell. So it would ring two, three times, wait, ring once, wait, ring two, three times, you know, whatever, and it would tell them directions. It would also give them directions as to who was coming, what other rival fire companies were coming to that fire, so they could have warnings going out. They, it was basically their way of communicating throughout the neighborhood, and rival gangs would actually try to mess with those, uh, with those bells, because if you're in a pitched street battle and you're trying to give information to somebody through the bell, it could easily be somebody could run into the house, take it over while you're not there, and give you the wrong information, thus causing you to go get ambushed um, or go a different direction so that the other company could take, uh, put out the fire. Um, so it, it, was, it was information, it was, uh, uh, it was their walkie-talkies back in the day. So, um, but if you can imagine the spectacle of them being up top, yelling down to the person, ringing the bell, and then people were running from all over the neighborhood to get into the house to grab their um, their buckets, their helmets, um, to start pulling the fire apparatus down the street, as well as half the marching band coming down the street. Because if you were big and tough and you had a real proper fire crew, you had a band that followed you. So it would be a huge procession down the street on their way to wherever they needed to go to. So where are we right now? Well, we're standing uh, um, on Lombard Street between High and Exeter on the north side of the street. And uh, in 1849, this would have been number 44 East Lombard Street, okay. otherwise known as Gunners Hall or Cornelius Ryan's Fourth Ward Poles. Okay. Um, so this there was is, a polling station. It was a bar. Right here. A it bar. was a bar. Okay. And the political powers at that time um, were staunch Democratic. Um, and they were able to place uh, uh, the polling house. They, they controlled where the polling houses were and put them in the thick of where their voting blocks were. And so on the particular election that uh, uh, Poe was found on, uh, he was found in a polling house, which would have been right here. Unfortunately, the original building doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Um, but it, this was in the middle of the neighborhood. It was a bar, and uh, often free drinks were given out to people to vote certain ways. So this is where this... Uh, where this, this happened. So um, he was inside the place, um, and then he was brought out into the street, and he was found, and where the famous letter of, we found a gentleman worse for wear, um, off to the Dr. Snodgrass. And that's, uh, the rest is history, as, as you can say. Now, over here on the corner, that's something that's a little bit interesting, is, is over here on High and Lombard, you had the Vigilant Fire Commission. Okay. Um, and they were known riders and roughnecks. Um, they were around during the, the days that uh, Poe uh, was found. Wow. So this is essentially the location. So you can kind of imagine, was he sitting on this, on this uh, curb right here? Was he laying on the ground? Was he in the bar? Um, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's interesting to, to, to think about. I, would, I wish that uh, the original building was still standing, but uh, uh, it is not. Sadly um, not. This, it looks like this whole like, little area has been redone. It has been redone. You, you have one of Baltimore's true gems, Atman's uh, uh, Doug Tessin right there. Now this was a very, um, after Poe's era and whatnot, um, this was the, the heart of the Jewish uh, section of Baltimore. Okay. But during Poe's time, we're actually in on the edge of Mechanics Row. 
um, Mechanics Row was a German neighborhood, um, which is now Little Italy. Okay. Um, but uh, during uh, the, the, the disappearance of Poe, this would have been a predominantly German neighborhood. Now, uh, Germans and the Irish tended to vote Democratic at that time. Okay. Um, the Democratic bosses were giving them jobs, and if you're coming here as an immigrant, that is something you wanted. Yeah. So, so this is it. This is, this is where, where he, he was, was found. And that's where some man just almost <laughs> flipped his car on his jack. <laughs> <laughs>